the world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and marketplace. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, your family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Cashflow Ninja and spending your most valuable resource, your time once again with me for another episode. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. When you go to CashflowNinja.com, you'll find that we have three podcasts. We have Cashflow Ninja, we have Cashflow Investing Secrets, and we have Reset Investing Secrets. You can also buy a copy of my book, The 21 Best Cashflow Niches, or subscribe to my newsletter, the best cash flow niches newsletter in which I share a brand new well researched cash flow niche every month or sign up for our mastermind, Cash Flow Nirvana. Cash Flow Nirvana was built for business owners and investors that's looking to protect and multiply wealth during turbulent times. Again, everything at Cash Flow Ninja. I've got a fantastic show for you today. I'm joined by returning guest Kevin Nichols from Penumbra Solutions. Kevin has been on the show several times talking about a very interesting and unique asset class called Life Settlements. Uh, you could go to CashflowNinja.com and just type in Kevin Nichols or Penumbra Solutions, and you'll find all the episodes that we've done with Kevin uh, over the past five, six years. Uh, Kevin, it's great to see you and have, having you back on uh, the show. Hey, great to see you, MC. So for folks that not is not familiar with you and what you do, we've got a lot of new listeners. Uh, can you please share a little bit about yourself, your background, your journey, and and, and what you're up to and, and what you guys do at Penumbra Solutions? Absolutely, thanks. We, uh, you know, we've been, uh, what we do is, we manage uh, private equity funds that invest in senior life settlements. And uh, a senior life settlement is a life insurance policy that a senior citizen no longer wants or needs. And uh, they offer it for sale. We buy it from them for more than the cash value, always more, always more than they would get if they were to surrender the policy. <clears throat> and um, we make the premium payments. And then when they pass, we collect the death benefit. Sometimes the, uh, the insured keeps a portion of the death benefit or their estate does. That's fine. It just is all negotiated up front. Uh, we don't ever go after people to convince them to sell. They come to us. They raise their hand and say, hey, I no longer need this policy or want it. And uh, I'd like to have some cash for it if I could. And so if it makes financial sense, we will we'll buy the policy. We got into this business. Oh, heavens, uh, probably 14 years ago as investors, we did uh, we purchased uh, so some what were what were known as fractions of senior life settlements. It was uh, they were smaller pieces, uh, and uh, had great success with those. Had some of our clients had invested in some of those as well, and had great success also. Uh, and so we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could just like put all these together in a pool, uh, so that when one person uh, you know experienced a gain, everybody would share in it, and if one person had to make a premium payment, we'd all share the burden of that. And um, that's what we did. And now, again, that was uh, 13 years, 13, well, that was about 13 years ago. And uh, we, we started setting up uh, private equity funds. They're Reg D Rule 506B funds. And um, we, we um, have done approximately one a year. We're in our 11th fund right now, Fund 11. Uh, and we buy policies. Uh, these are all American insureds from American companies. Uh, a or better rated companies. We're so what we're doing is we're buying our growth in advance. Uh, and the people who are guaranteeing that growth are the, you know, the, the mass mutuals and the, the, the New York life uh, 
companies uh, that, uh, you know, of America. And so we're confident that we're going to get paid. We've never not gotten paid on any policy. Uh, you know, we've never had uh, uh, had a thing. We've never had a person lose money in a fund. Uh, once we buy the policies, of course, we don't know when the people are going to pass. Uh, but we specialize in buying policies on older individuals, which, uh, you know, the life expectancy is typically uh, it's hopefully more known. Um, but we also have medical companies that underwrite every policy that say yes, they give us an estimate when they think they're going to going to pass. We compare that to the CDC's actuarial tables, the insurance industry's VBT tables. And from there, we have about five tests that a policy will have to pass to let us know if it's going to be profitable when there's an when 80 percent of the people in that group have passed. Will we still be profitable? And if the answer is yes, then we typically will buy the policy, depending on the insurance load, and some other variables. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a good business. It's it's a good, safe place for uh you know, your retirement money. It's not for all of your money. Like we say, it's only for the money you can't afford to lose. Some people that uh, enjoy being in the market or watching things or manipulating things and having hands on, uh, they don't like this investment because it's probably the most boring investment you can possibly be in. We buy the policies, we wait. And uh, when people pass, we collect the, the benefit. And there's nothing we can do in the interim to uh, enhance or defer any yield at all. Uh, so there's really not much we can do. Um, we invest right alongside your investors in every single fund. So in fact, across all the funds, we are the largest investors. So, uh, you know, we believe, uh, like they say here in Texas, <clears throat> it, each, it, we, we eat our own chili. So um, in a nutshell, that's really it. We start, we got our start, my partner and I got our start as uh, financial planners. And um, just like most of, most of the people who come to us come from their uh, financial planner. And um, so after our first fund, it was became clear that we created this beast and we had no, we would have no time to do any financial planning direct uh, with it, with uh, clients any longer. So we stopped and we simply manage these funds. Uh, we have uh, it's my business partner, Jim Walsh and I, and uh, my daughter Holland Nichols. And so, uh, you know, it's a good business. Uh, something happens to me or Jim uh, it really has no effect uh, on the yield or the return to the investors because uh, everything is set up through Bank of Utah. They manage all the money. We don't ever touch the investor's money. Uh, and we have uh, some companies that we uh, pay to uh, to help us uh, manage the, the premiums. They, they tell us what the least amount of money is that we can pay on a policy, when to pay it. They also track the death of these individuals so that if someone passes, we know right away. Uh, and um, once the premiums have been paid to the company, they check to make sure that the premium was applied correctly. Uh, believe it or not, that can be an issue. So, um, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a good investment. It's been good to us and it's been good to uh, our investors as well. I want to take a moment to share something very important right now. Are you trying to figure out how to protect your savings from the banking collapse, which has already started, and the coming financial crisis. Most banks will fail. Deposits that are not insured by the FDIC will be lost, and there will be bank bail-ins. And this collapse in the banking system will lead to chaos in the financial system. Banks also provide loans to real estate investors. So what do you think? is going to happen to lending in the event of a banking and a financial crisis. You can be proactive and position your savings to protect it and also have access to it to use it to buy discounted assets by positioning it in your own banking system through the infinite banking concept strategy. Producers Wealth has put together a presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com where you will learn how to position capital outside of the banking system and the Wall, Wall Street casino, just like the ultra-wealthy, to protect it and create a pool of tax-free liquid capital to capitalize on the massive opportunity to buy discounted assets, which is coming. You can access the presentation 
at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. It's a very misunderstood asset class, right? Life mm -hmm. settlement. So you're buying yes. and selling life insurance policies just as uh, someone would sell mortgages, right? Real, we have a lot yes. of real estate investors that listen to that. They understand that you can buy and sell a note, yes. uh, a mortgage. It's it's you know it's eerie how similar the asset class of life insurance is to real estate, actually. Yes. But it's a very misunderstood asset class. So can you just talk about um the uh well there's a legal president for this there's settled sure. case law on this yes. and then also um you know explain if you know in a in a you've you've kind of given an overview but just the mechanics of how life settlements work sure absolutely the legal precedent is 1911 uh the case is Griggs B versus Russell uh where a a surgeon uh accepted a life insurance policy in exchange for doing surgery for uh, a patient. Uh, a few years later, the, the patient passed and the, uh, the surgeon uh, tried to collect on the death benefit of the policy. It went all the way to the Supreme Court because the company didn't want to pay, claiming that he didn't have an insurable interest. The Supreme Court ruled on it and uh, the, the, the majority opinion was written by none other than Oliver Wendell Holmes, who stated that once a policy has gone past the contestability period, uh, it is personal property and that people can do with, with it as they choose. They can sell it if they want. They can give it away. They can do whatever they choose. And so it was upheld. And uh, that has remained the law of the land uh, thus far. Uh, from time to time, an insurance company will try and contest the payment of the death benefit on the basis of there was no insurable interest in the policy to begin with. Uh, and so we make sure that <clears throat> when the insured took the policy out, that they had an insurable, in that there was an insurable interest at that time. Uh, you can't, if, if I don't, we don't, if someone has a life insurance policy that they own, that they took out on somebody that they don't even know, that's a, a real red flag. We don't, we won't even get involved. So uh, we have to know that there was an insurable interest established, the insurance company uh, uh, accepted it, that the insured actually made some of the payments themselves, because when you get into financing, some people finance the premiums on these, these policies. We won't accept a policy that, that is 100% financed. They have to have had some skin in the game at some point in time. Uh, and uh, one of the last things we do, we use an escrow uh, when we buy a policy. It's called a life settlement provider, and that is law throughout this country in all 50 states. You have to use a company that is a life settlement provider. All of them, to my knowledge, have uh, attorneys and that's what they do. Uh, and so when we buy a policy, we make sure that the beneficiaries sign off on it. The insured, of course, has to sign off on it. Uh, if they are not of sound mind, they must be represented by counsel. Uh, and then we also uh, make sure that the, the insurance company signs off. They understand that the, the insured is, is selling the policy. It gives the insurance company one last chance if they want to try and buy the policy and make a better deal, which will, uh, that has happened in the past, albeit very, very seldom, but that's fine. Uh, and then um, we make sure that there are no liens on the policy. The policy is not in grace and it has never lapsed. Uh, and we'll get a, a, a current illustration so we know what our obligation is going forward. Uh, and then when uh, it finally closes and we own the policy, we, we change the insured, we change the beneficiary. And uh, that way there's, there's no misconception or no, no misunderstanding as to what's happening. And uh, by doing it that way, over more than 1,800 policies over the last 13 years, we've never had one that was contested, never had one that didn't pay. Uh, you know, what you want is you don't, you don't want any impropriety or even appearance of impropriety in this business. Once that happens, you're done. Your dad, people won't trust you. And so... We don't, like I said, we don't touch, we don't touch the money. We don't, uh, we use a, a third party escrow and we never speak directly to the insured uh, because you need to main maintain an arm's length so that there's no appearance of manipulation or trying to, to, uh, uh, to sell the individual. You know, you don't want that. You want to be completely arm's length on every transaction. We make sure that happens. Can you just provide a little bit of a, a just a quick oversight of of kind of the environment because this is what big 
institutions, finance, banking and financial institutions, and of course, hedge funds and family offices and so forth. They're huge buyers of life insurance policies. So there's a massive market. There's an entire industry for this. Uh, something that I, when I really uh, uh, did a deep dive on this, found fascinating too, was through uh, risk management of insurance carriers. They actually buy each other's policies too uh, as a risk management strategy. So this is done in a marketplace. There's a huge market for this. This is done by institutions. And maybe if you can just comment on that and then also just share that how basically now uh, accredited investors can get involved, right? Because yeah. most people think, well, I'm not an institution. How do yeah. I get to participate into this and kind of how uh, they can now? Yeah, absolutely. So the first, your first question was, who are some of the major players in this, the big players? And, you know, that is, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that is a very seldom asked question uh, in, in this business. And, Believe it or not, the largest purchaser of life settlements is AIG. Now, you may, may ask, wait a minute, how? I've never heard that. Well, they don't do it under, under their own name. Of course, uh, they've set up a separate company and they buy billions of dollars of life settlements. Now, why do they buy life settlements? Well, they know that a, they've got deep pockets and their expected yield is, is not huge either because they're not trying to hit home runs on things. Their risk management department has to be very cautious. So they are a huge player in this. Who are other players in this? <clears throat> Berkshire Hathaway, uh, uh, Warren Buffett himself, uh, the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A lot of major banks and commercial banks have in the past and still purchase life settlements. Now, do you hear about it? No, you don't. Uh, because <clears throat> why would you? They wouldn't, they don't share that information with you. Um, but they are the biggest players. Um, so that they typically buy policies from younger individuals than we do. And the reason they do is they can they can buy a policy. And they are prepared to hold it for 20 years until the individual passes. We're not really interested in that. We don't want policies that are going to be going that long. We really want to target policies for individuals that are over 90 years old, where the life expectancy is going to be somewhere in the next 10 years. The number of people that are over 100 is very, very low. So it's very seldom that someone goes that long. We buy... Uh, Universal life policies. <clears throat> now, as a rule, it, you know, universal life policies uh, <clears throat> are not as but, well. A, they're 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 not as cash rich as whole life policies. Whole life policies have their place. It's not for us. Whole life policies are great as a retirement tool for someone who wants to build wealth and then borrow against it, uh, using that money as income for in their in their retirement. Uh, for our purposes, the premium load from a, a whole life policy is too high. So we, we try and avoid those. Now, do we have we purchased them in the past? Yes, we have. We probably have mm, six or seven. So we don't want a term policy because term policies can term out. And that is not what we're, we're looking for. But most term policies today are written with what's called a convertibility writer, where the insured can at any time convert that policy from a term policy to a universal life policy. What happens when, when that occurs? They have, now they have guaranteed renewability until age 100, 105, sometimes 120, uh, but it's going to be at a higher premium. Okay, so for them, that may not be very attractive. For us, that's what we need. It has to be converted to a, to a universal life policy so that we have guaranteed renewability. Now, the premiums go up quite a bit, but we know what they're going to be, and we can then make a financial decision based upon that information. So we get a current illustration on every single policy. We do not want to be building cash value in these policies. We want to pay the absolute least amount on every policy, and we want to pay it uh, probably at the very last minute 
so that we're not having money sitting in these policies. Uh, and we pay a company that does nothing but that. They optimize the premiums on every single policy. They also track death benefit for us. Uh, and uh, that keeps us from, from having money sitting in policies. So uh, I'm not sure if I got all your questions there, but I think I did. Yeah, no, you absolutely did. And for okay. folks that are hearing about this for the first time, uh, they might be thinking, well, why would somebody sell a life insurance policy? And actually, if you really look into it, you know, folks kind of have a different view on yeah. life settlements. Um, you know, can you explain how this is a win-win and structured and uh, why would people would be selling their life insurance policies? Sure, absolutely. So let's go back, uh, uh, say, let's go back 20 years. And it was even maybe more, 30, 20 to 30 years. What, what started happening was people who had AIDS, at the time that was a death sentence and they had a life insurance policy. They, they had a very short life expectancy and so they would sell the policy. Now that was called, or that was known as a viatical. A viatical is a policy that somebody wants to sell and they are otherwise healthy except for one specific illness or uh, impairment, if you will. Uh, and so they would sell the policy and the per person or inst institution who purchased the that viatical would hold on to it, make the premium payments. Uh, and then when the person did pass, uh, they would collect a death benefit. A senior life settlement is someone who doesn't really have, uh, they're older, they're going to be typically over 75. Uh, and they may not have a terminal condition. In other words, terminal is a specific word or a specific term used in the life insurance business. Generally, it means you have less than a year to live. Uh, so most of these people do not have terminal conditions. However, how long will a perfectly healthy 90 year old live if they are otherwise healthy? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you answer that question? Well, using the Center for Disease Control, they have an, a, an enormous actuarial department and they track everybody in the country. Additionally, the valuation basic tables, which is the insurance industry's answer to the CDC, it tracks only people who are insurable. So they're typically healthier. So we'll use that information and say, OK, if someone's 88 years old and it's a male and he grew up in the Northeast, what is his life expectancy if he is otherwise healthy? And so we'll use that information and say, OK, 50 percent of them will have passed in, in this many years. OK, so that's that's a number. Seventy five percent will have passed at this point. Twenty five percent will have passed at this point. And so we plug that into an algorithm that we've developed that tells us whether or not this is most likely going to be a profitable policy for us. So the, the, the huge institutions, they're looking for policies in the 75 to 80 to 85 year old range. And what that leaves is people that are older than that, be, uh, that it's a market that has essentially uh, not been addressed. And we started addressing it, like I said, about 13 years ago, because what we found was that when you're that old, when you're, say, 88 years old and you don't have a health impairment, um, you have to reserve more for premiums. Say, for example, we had a $10 million fund, okay? If we raised $10 million, we would probably hold back five to four to $5 million, 40 to 50% in reserve to pay the premiums, okay? So that means we can only deploy half of the money to actually buy policies. That model isn't acceptable to a lot of the institutions because they have to create income from the policies that they purchase and we get paid when we buy these policies. So the more money we can deploy, the more money we make. However, you're, you have to live with the fact that if you are in that industry, you're more than likely going to be sitting on these things for 15 to 20, 25 years. And so your fund has to remain open. It's not a good fit for what we do for our model. So we, we focus on older policies. We deploy less capital. But it, by deploying less capital, we may say we deploy, say, $6 million in a $10 million fund and hold back $4 million. We still can get death benefit of, say, 30 to $35 million. OK, so uh, say it's $30 million. Now, on a, 10, on a $10 million fund, because we have to that's the total amount we raised, that's an equity multiplier, $30 million to $10 million.
of three to one. Now we try and we try and have equity multipliers be three and a half or four to one. Some of them have been over five. Okay, but know that as people live longer you start to diminish or deteriorate that equity multiplier. But if you start with an equity multiplier of say three and a half, and you end up with an overall equity multiplier after everything is said and done and everyone has passed, if you're still over two and a half to 2.75, that means that you just made 2.75 times, times your money over the life of the fund, which is say eight to 10 years. That's still exceptional as a yield. And given that your money was never at risk in the market, we never touched your money. Uh, most people look at that and say, you know what, this is a win. And it has been, and it's proven to be. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Penumbra Solutions. Life Settlements Investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion-dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. If you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments, Penumbra Solutions, at CashflowNinja.com, forward slash life settlements. That's cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. The password to access that webinar is pen number, all lowercase. So just to like a quick example for folks, um, let's just say there's a life insurance policy with a million dollar death benefit. And let's just say that person has, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars in cash value which is not enough to have them live out their life comfortably no. the, the final couple of years. So what they would do then is they would go and sell it. Let's just say somebody buys it for 500,000. Let's just say I prefer simple math. So, no. or even 400,000, right? Four times, I think is like on average, what uh, more, what, what sellers of these would get um, in certain circumstances for the policy. So 400,000. So they had a hundred thousand in cash value, they sell that life insurance policy with a death benefit of a million and they get 400,000. Now the person that just sold that policy gets to live out comfortably the remainder of their lives yes. without any financial stress or restraints and so forth. And then the buyer of that policy, then upon the passing of that person, then gets paid out the million, which in this case, you know, if you if you if you um bought it for 400,000 and you got you got a million, your profit would be 600,000. But as you shared, your factor here at play is time. So the yes. longer it takes, it can eat into that. So yes. when you when you hear the term, uh, you know, the big institutions like Warren Buffett and, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so forth and AIG, they buy their equity up front. Yes. That kind of means they know what the payout is going to be the minute they make that purchase. The only defining factor there that determines how much profitability is in that policy is time, right? Exactly. Well, that de time determines yield. So death yeah. benefit de determines overall, uh, overall payout. So if you paid a half a million dollars, well, in the example you used, okay, so let's use that. Uh, the the cash value in the policy was uh, uh, hundred thousand dollars. First thing they're going to do is go to say the policy was written through Mass Mutual, and so the first thing they will do is go to Mass Mutual and say, "What will you give me for the policy?" Mass Mutual says, "We'll give you hundred thousand dollars because that's the cash value." And they say, "Well, we're thinking about we want to sell the policy," and so Mass Mutual then have will have a business decision. Okay, we'll give you a hundred thousand, and we'll give you one ten, we'll give you one fifty, whatever that number is. They then have that information. From there, they'll come to us, not directly because we don't deal directly with the insurance, but they'll come through a broker. Okay, so a broker would then represent them and they would come to us and say, what do you give us for this policy? And say we agreed to give them a half a million dollars, which, by the way, would be high. We would not probably be a buyer at that level. But let's just use your example. So the first thing we know is that we pay a half a million dollars, but we've also got $100,000 of cash value in that policy. So our net cost is only going to be 400000 So what we would do is we would leave that $100,000 in the policy and we would use it to make the premium payments for the next two to three years. If the individual passes in that time, it's a huge windfall for us. 
Okay. And once we get to the end of that time, we may reevaluate that policy and say, okay, now we're going to have to start making premium pay payments on this policy. So do we want to keep it or do we want to sell it on the tertiary market? Now, institutions sell policies between themselves all the time. And probably half the policies that we purchase are on the tertiary market. The other half, of course, are in the secondary market, which is where we buy it directly from the insured. So uh, we have a business decision then to make as to the cost of the policy, the expected life of the individual. And so we make that decision there based upon that information that we have. Um, so the big, big institutions, they have a lot more money to, to play with. And so they can hold these policies for longer. But I would tell you that they are not going to buy a policy from someone who's 88 years old because the premium load would be too high. And they would need to deploy more capital than they like. So they're going to be buying policies from people that are 72 to 77 years old, where the premiums are much lower. Uh, they may decide uh, to leave the policy as a, uh, a, a term policy, okay, which they can do, and then convert it later, okay? Uh, and uh, it, it keeps their costs down. So they want to deploy as little capital as possible. Furthermore, if they need to make, to make premium payments, they, are, they can borrow money to do that. Now, see, we don't do that. Can we do that? Yes, we could, but we do not go into debt on any, any funds. And I'll tell you why. If, if we borrowed 85% of the investors in our funds, our funds are designed for accredited investors, and 85% of the investors in our funds are using qualified money, whether it's IRA money, 401k money, what have you, Okay. When you introduce debt into a fund, technically they owe a part of that debt as the, as the limited partner in that uh, fund. It does whether or not it actually works that way is uncertain because the IRS has refused to give us an answer on that. They will not give us their opinion and we don't want their opinion. So we prefer just to stay under the radar and not ever borrow money so that they ever have a reason to say, hey, let's look at this closely. Um, what we do a lot, uh, I mean, we have, what we, one thing we do a lot is, is a lot of our investors will, will use this as a vehicle to convert uh, a traditional IRA to, to a Roth IRA, um, which is a brilliant move. And this is a brilliant asset for that. Based, because of how the fund operates and works, Generally, we tell people to wait between three and four years. So if, say, you invested $100,000 in our fund and you were interested in converting that from a traditional to a Roth IRA, we'll typically advise you, let's wait, okay? Unless you want to do it right now or your tax advisor or your uh, uh, financial uh, planner says we should do it now, then by all means do it. But there is a significant, there's probably a, there could be as much as a $20,000 tax savings if they were to wait and do it in years three to four. And so most people will do that. Jim and I have both done that personally. Uh, it's a great strategy. It's perfectly legal. And uh, as long as we can still have Roth IRAs until the government takes those away from us, uh, it's, it's a great plan. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors. My friend Dave Zook says, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy. Pick one. At The Real Asset Investor, Dave and his team bring their investors high-yield investment opportunities across several asset classes for cash flow, tax impact, and equity growth. He and his team are one of the top five ATM operators in the country, and they have an investment opportunity available to accredited investors right now in the ATM space. To learn more about their ATM funds that produce tax-free cash flow, visit therealassetinvestor.com. That's therealassetinvestor.com. And this is heavily regulated too, because that's a frequently asked question that I get about what is, how does this work? Because even mm -hmm. the fund that you guys have, that's a security. So yes, there's securities laws in place. And then there's, you know, obviously insurance regulations. There's lawyers mm -hmm. involved with the buying and the selling. I'm sure there's a regulatory framework there. So this is a very heavily, heavily regulated you know, uh, area. It's so true. And, you know, there was a, there was an article written about five years ago that says, that, you know, life settlements, it's the wild west of financial institutions, which 
You know, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, <laughs> we have to answer to, you know, the SEC uh, because it is a security. We have to answer to the, to the IRS because of the fact that most, uh, most of our investors are using IRA money. Uh, we have to answer to the local uh, uh, securities law, not only in Texas, but every single state from which we have an investor, we have to register in that state and then we have to meet their requirements. And then we also have to meet the, uh, the, the rules and regulations. We have to pass that in the state of Texas as well. So we have everybody looking over our shoulder. Again, as you, as you alluded to, every policy that we purchase, we have to use a life settlement provider, which is a, a legal entity that is registered in that state, the state in which the insured lives. So if we buy a policy from someone who lives in Wyoming, we have to use uh, someone who is registered in Wyoming. So we, we, stay, we try and stay above the fray in every single issue here. Uh, and that's very important. And that's why we've never been sued in any of this. And we've never been even, there's never been a question of impropriety ever. Uh, and we prefer to keep it that way. Now, one thing for sure, uh, we, this is designed for accredited investors. And I, a lot of your investors, they maybe they may not know or may feel like they're on the, the, the cusp of being an accredited investor. Uh, we can accept up to 35 non-accredited investors in every fund, and we do. Um, but it's designed for accredited investors. The most important question is, are you, do you know that you're going to need this money in the next 10 years? Even though you're going to start getting payouts probably in year four, three, four, five. Uh, but if I, what we don't know is there's no certainty as to when people are going to pass. So if you know for sure that you're going to need the money in the next 10 years, I will tell a client, don't put it here. Just don't put it here because I don't want the pressure of having to get you out of the fund. Now, we have had people who've had emergencies and had to get out and we've been able to get them out of the fund. But it's a big hassle because imagine you and five of your best friends decide to buy a huge plot of land. And, you know, a couple of years down the road, one of your buddies says, hey, man, I got to go. I got to get out. What are you going to do? Well, you, you're going to have to find somebody to buy him out, to buy his share out. And that's what we have to do. And so it's a, it's, it's a pain. Uh, but, you know, that's why it's really designed for accredited investors. Yeah, very, very good point. Yeah, the, and of course, this plays into portfolio diversification, mm. uh, yeah. you know, as you mentioned earlier on. Um, I've done several episodes with Kevin on this. Um, you could go to cashflowninja.com and just check out, just type in Kevin Nichols or per number solutions where we deep dive into many different areas. So this was great to get a snapshot of, um, you know, most, the most frequently asked questions of what life settlements are, how they work, the mechanics, the regu regulatory framework, where they kind of fit in and so forth. So appreciate you giving us a, a pretty good picture of uh, the industry and of the asset class. Kevin, where can um, listeners and viewers, where can they learn more about um, you guys, what you do, and sure. um, where can they get in touch if they're interested to learn more about um what you guys have to offer, and then also where can they stay informed of all the other pro many projects that you guys are involved in? Sure, absolutely. They can reach us here in South Lake, Texas. They can call my office directly. The phone number here is area code 817-479-9770. Uh, and uh, that, that'll come into the office. And and uh, if I'm in the office, Holly will, will uh, direct it to me. They can uh, look at, we have an online video presentation. Admittedly, it's old. But it's there, and uh, the details really haven't changed much, uh, and that is uh, the penumbraplan.com. Penumbra is spelled P as in Paul, E, N as in Nancy, U, M as in Mary, B, R, A, plan.com. Uh, from there, they'll have to enter their, their name and their email address and tell us how they heard about it. Uh, uh, and we don't, we, don't send, we don't take those email addresses and start mass marketing to them. We don't do that. Uh, but we will reply to that email address and give them access to uh, other information one time so that they're able to uh, download uh, uh, the current uh, memorandum of private placement, also known as a PPM. We'll send them an FAQ sheet so they can, it's questions that they didn't think about. And of course, they're free to talk to me anytime. They can reach me at Kevin at Penumbra Solutions with an S, Kevin at Penumbra Solutions. Dot com, and I'm happy to answer any questions they might have.
Fantastic. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming back on the show and sharing your insights and all of your knowledge surrounding this very, very unique and interesting asset class. Yes, thank you. Been a pleasure. Uh, as always, MC, great to be with you again and uh, uh, best to you and your family. And uh, it's been a great, been a great time. Thank you. And thank you to all of my listeners and viewers out there for again, spending your most valuable resource, your time once again with me. Uh, everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals. And you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.